Well, hello, I'm Mike Bird, and I'm joined with my good friend, Pastor Dan Kimball from the, so the Vintage Church, isn't it? It's the Vintage Church. In, vintage Church. Okay. Great. Um, down in um, California, uh, which I've heard is a lovely part of the world. Actually, where, where is Santa Cruz in relation to LA? For those of us, I know I, I know LA because I fly into LA a lot. But apart from that, it's a little bit of a there's Disneyland to the north, I believe. After that, it's a bit of a bit of a blur for me. We hung out in San Francisco that one time, and I live about 70, 80 miles south of San Francisco. So uh, Santa Cruz is on the Monterey Bay. It's a beach town, about 75, 80 miles uh, on the coast, south of San Francisco. Okay, so it's probably nowhere near LA. It's closer to, to San Fran. Yeah, it, nearest airport would be San Jose. Okay, there. that's good. That's good. Okay, well, it's good. Whenever Americans ask me what the um, what Sydney is like, I mean, I'm in Melbourne, but when they ask me what Sydney is like, I tell them, imagine if San Francisco and um, Detroit made a baby. Um, that's how that's how I'd, I would describe Sydney. Uh, well, anyway, Dan, it's great to be hanging out with you as always. Uh, but I think we're going to uh, kick off by looking at your book, you know, How Not to Read the Bible, Making Sense of the Anti-Women, Anti-Science, Pro-Slavery, Pro-Slavery, and Other Crazy Sounding Parts of Scripture. Um, the, the only thing I don't like about this book is that I never wrote it because I think this is this is terrific. And you, you deal wonderfully with all those those bits of the Bible that kind of bug people and they might lead people to think, well, the Bible is kind of, you know, you know, genocidal, misogynistic, xenophobic and and that type of thing. Um, and what, what, what made you write a book like this, Dan? Yeah, I do think it's a. Uh maybe Zondervan's only book that has a dinosaur, Jesus, and a unicorn on the cover. So I'm, uh, I'm pleased that the art- He does not that. lie. He does not lie. Yeah. Um, what made me write it was being in ministry in local church for years and years, and uh, particularly listening a lot to younger voices and questions, and, um, and then seeing an accelerated rate of uh, uh, kind of what you're hearing in the States, at least, about deconstruction stories, like I can't believe in the faith anymore. And very often what we're hearing is stories about, you know, I can't believe in a God that would, you know, this is the word, you know, like kill babies in the Old Testament or, you know, the mythical accounts. I mean, some of this is like standard that's been around for a while about, you know, science and creation and, and different types of things. But what's accelerated is uh, there's been specific, uh, as in the book, you know, memes, lots of stuff on the internet, um, raising up to the surface, a lot of these crazy sounding things from the Bible, anti-women, strong anti-women Bible verses, and it's catching Christians off guard. And I think that's probably what really is alarming to me is that Christians who uh, are seeing these things like, I didn't realize they were really in there, or I never paid attention to them now. And now that they're being pointed out on the internet so, so often, and these deconstruction stories are being told, it's kind of becoming almost like a social contagion thing about, I don't know if I can believe in the Bible anymore. Um, you know, it's anti-women, it's pro-slavery. And so I wrote this book to address those very things and take a look at what is the Bible and how should we read it and how not to read it. Okay, that's that's a very good idea. That's a very good idea. Um, yeah, because this this sort of this you know exvangelical thing is you know well it's, it's a bit of a thing for a start, and, and that's caused by a whole bunch of things. I think you know the the over politicization of evangelicalism with one you know particular political party. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's that's caused it. But like you said, you know this kind of well read read the Bible and you know what's all these things about you know or, you know women and and war and and violence and you know and and you know how does this line up with science and then people it's people take a little bit of a tidbit of it and they create this meme and then they just mock it you know um that kind of thing and, and there is that kind of you know that snarky um 
uh, ex-evangelical, ex-Christian going on. And then you've got this deconstruction phenomena. Now, I've got a vague idea what that is, Dan. I mean, can you, can you tell me or explain to me and anyone watching what this sort of, you know, deconstructing your faith thing is about? Yeah, it's often by uh, Christians that were, um, it seems like the patterns are they're raised in a church they um, you know, had belief. And here's the difference I think of in the past is these churches are like relevant ones with good music, uh, you know, felt need preaching. These aren't like uh, the churches were backwards and it was boring and it was organ music or something. These are like relevant thriving churches. And then as they're growing up in them, when they start uh, reaching the good point in life, you know, like they start questioning their faith um, or even later on in life, when they have their 30s sometimes, it's almost delayed, they start questioning their faith, and, and then they're saying, I don't think I can believe in, I didn't know that, why is God so violent, you know, yeah. there are, there are pro-slavery verses, uh, does the Bible really say for women to, you know, be silent and not talk in church, because there's the scripture, and they've kind of skimmed it over, but never studied it or paid attention, and like you mentioned, there's sort of like a, an activism going on to against the Bible. And you'll see it, that's why you'll see a picture of a woman with her mouth taped shut in the Bible verse, women be silent. You'll see, uh, you know, evil looking pictures of, of uh, it's basically the African-American kidnapped evil slavery that happened, happened in the States, those images. And then with New Testament Bible verses, you know, slaves obey your masters, underneath them, which is wrongly equating those two types of slavery. That's, in other words, you see this over and over again, and there's probably other stuff going on in people's lives, and now it's almost becoming a trend to deconstruct your faith, and I'm now evolving, and I'm moving on to something more, and that's what's happening quite often. So I wrote this, hopefully, to say, to teach, um, no matter what you find out, there's lots of strange things in the Bible, but if you know a little bit more of how to study it, how, how to read it, how not to, then you won't be so caught off guard when these, these and other things that you'll read about in there. That is why I'm excited about your book coming out. So I know this is what we're talking about. I'm so thrilled about yours, about you know, what you wish Christians knew about the Bible, because that's going to be so helpful to people. Yeah, I mean, like you, I'm trying to, I'm trying to fill in a gap. Uh, mine's not specifically orientated towards the um, those questioning their faith, although in, in many sense, I think it, it could help them with that or maybe inoculate them against some um, unhelpful approaches to the Bible that, that may lead them down uh, a, a bit of a you know, dark rabbit hole. You know, I want Christians to, you know, not get sucked into some of the weird conspiracy theories like, you know, didn't Constantine invent the Bible in the fourth century or or not to know about some of those difficult parts of the Old Testament, you know, um, you know about warfare, about what you do with prisoners of war, particularly, you know, uh, the women. Uh, we, we, they are in there. I mean, you have to acknowledge that and you have to do that. And that is really challenging uh, if you s believe in what you would call biblical normativity. If you, like if you believe, you know, we should obey and follow God's teaching in scripture, then some of that weird stuff, that stuff that kind of makes you you know, uh, blink or raise your eyebrows. You have to accept that's in there. And you've got to know why it's in there and what to do with it now. And that's right. why it helps by knowing things like, I mean, knowing stuff like uh, not everything in the Bible is ideal, okay? Like, mm -hmm. you know, the scripture doesn't say like, this is the best way to conduct warfare. I mean, there's nothing like that that says this is the best way to go to war. Uh, going to war, I think, in the Bible is treated as a bad thing, a sad thing, a tragic thing, a, a thing of human corruption and, and depravity. But if you're stuck in fighting intertribal warfare, you know, in the land of Canaan, where you've got the Assyrians, the Babylonians or the Canaanites, whatever. Well, this is the way warfare is done in that world. And this is how you have to, in, in the most gruesome uh gruesome sense survive okay and and this is how god's people are to live i mean william webb you know uses the example of god leading his people through a sewer trying to get them you know you know putting god puts on his hazmat suit and leads them through a sewer of human existence i mean that's that that, that is i think partly you know in, in a world that is cold brutal and dark this is how we 
kind of get through and with a view to something better coming on the horizon. So simply accepting that uh, not everything in the Bible is ideal, okay? It, it's kind of like a, an interim survival mechanism, um, you know, for God's people at a particular juncture of history uh, is something I, can, I think that, uh, can help you. But then there's all the other questions people get to, like what's the word inspiration mean? What's, what's infallibility mean? Um, you know, I want to, you know, want to deal with some of that kind of stuff. Or how do I, how do I read um, the Bible? Do I have much historical background? I mean, do you need to know that? Does that help? That kind of thing. So that, that's that's kind of where I'm getting into. I, I guess I'm, I'm wanting to help Christians get more out of their Bible and not get stuck on some of those things that can pick, tr trick people up. Uh, I mean, I don't know you, but like one question I get uh, thrown at me, and this is often more by critics saying, well, yeah, you, you, you believe in the Bible, you believe in the Bible, then why are you against, you know, polyamory, you know, you know, uh, polygamy, because there's polygamy in the Bible. I mean, you, 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 you get that one, don't you, Dan? You get that one? Yeah, no, I, yeah, I wrote about polygamy in two. Okay, well, I'll have to, I have to tell you my answer first. I have to tell you my answer because it's a good one. When people ask me about polyamory, I tell them it's wrong because it combines a Greek prefix with a Latin suffix. It should be polyphilia or multiamory. You should not be combining Greek and Latin fragments of words because, you know, who among you wants to eat a spaghetti souvlaki or visit a... Yeah. Or visit a country where the prime minister's name is Bellasconi Papadopoulos. So uh, combining Italian and Greek things, I think, is just wrong to begin with. But beyond be, beyond the kind of uh, linguistic fusion of Latin and Greek things, uh, I think there are some other reasons why we don't do poly polygamy today. I mean, what, what's your view on that, Dan? Well, I was going. What I was going to say earlier was, and you might view polygamy. Why? Well, I think it was God was there were certain things that were happening culturally in that time period that God did not institute himself, but he worked with that was already yeah. in existence. But I wanted to raise up something because like when you started talking about Old Testament culture and some of these things, you're getting animated, you're getting excited about it. And I wish Christians would do the same. I think a lot of Christians know more about the storyline of Star Wars or Lord of the Rings and can even get into some of the details of the different time periods and the different, than they do in the God that they worship and his story from Genesis to Revelation that he's revealed to us through scripture. Because when you do look at the Bible like that, and that's why I really believe that people would, would be excited about reading the Bible when you understand the storyline and then you can get into those discussions like as you were getting animated with it. That's why I love the Bible. And it's sad, that's why I'm excited about your book, because it's sad that people don't understand that about the Bible, and we can get more excited about Star Wars than we can the, the amazing story of God and people and redemption and Jesus and where we came from and, and the future. So that's what I hope our, you know, our combined mission is with these writings, too. Yeah, I, I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, knowing that the bigger storyline helps you deal with the other the other individual parts. Yeah, again, it's obvious polygamy is not ideal. We get the ideal view set out in in, in Genesis, which then Jesus infer, affirms as well, marriage between man and a woman. But in the context of the ancient Near East, where you've got military alliances, where you've got to try, you know, in a world with high infant mortality, you have to kind of generate as many kind of offspring as you can. You know, uh, you've got all sorts of, you know, cultural mores and things which are very specific. You know, polygamy can, in a sense, make sense, but it was never ideal. And in fact, generally, polygamy tends to end pretty badly for everyone, whether that's Abraham or, or, or Solomon. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, but that, that point, knowing the Bible storyline is, is, is such an important thing. Um, like as a seminary professor, I often get asked to like, you know, um, have a look at some Old Testament papers, you know, and, you know, one of the most terrifying things you can do to seminary students, and these are meant to be the best and brightest of our churches, is ask them, what is the purpose of the purity laws in the Old Testament? You know, some of those laws you get in, in Leviticus, what's the purpose of them? And uh, students often say things like, well, the laws are pretty stupid, but, you know, God's God, he can do what he likes. I mean, you, you get stuff like that, which I find like, whoa, I mean, that's, if, if, if that's what someone with a high view of scripture thinks, 
you can imagine what someone with a low view of scripture thinks. So this is definitely a plug for, you know, as much as we love uh, Jesus and the apostles, um, their message, their story is very much according to the scriptures, according to the Old Testament. So knowing the Old Testament story and, you know, the purpose of the, of the law, you know, the prophets, the writings, everything is really going to help. Uh, the, one, the one thing that's given me hope here, Dan, is um, Sally Lloyd-Jones's um, little um, storybook for children, you know, the Jesus storybook. That gives me a lot of solace because uh, a lot of students I find, particularly um, students I have with um, small children, are telling me they're learning biblical theology from, read from reading the Sally Lloyd-Jones, the Jesus storybook. And that's their first exposure to the idea that the Bible actually has a coherent storyline. Because before that, it was just a mass of Sunday school. It's like God makes the world and then Adam fell and then Abraham built an ark and then he kind of landed on a mountain and met a guy called Pharaoh and um, Pharaoh then warned him about the coming of the Persians and the Persians cast aspersions on him so God burnt down Sodom and Gomorrah and they then built a tower to Babylon and Jesus came down the tower um, yeah. there is I mean a lot of Christians it's just like you know it's it's like for some Christians the Old Testament be like those medieval ocean maps that said and here there be dragons like on the margins of the story um, yeah it is it is it is kind of um, concerning and that's why I think people can get you know um, it gets suckered in by some conspiracy theories or by the latest snarky meme. And, you know, and, and I, I do think we need to, you know, we, we need to be able to appreciate that, you know, the Old Testament is two thirds of our Bible. Um, and do you find that? Do you find that there's uh, a somewhat aversion or ignorance or misunderstanding about the Old Testament in, in a lot of churches? Yeah, well, I think when I mean, you kind of said it a little bit was that uh, what we've done is we've painted, say, even the story of Noah and his ark. And you go in, you know, Sunday school classrooms and you'll see the picture of the ark with the, all the animals, you know, kind of like cartoon like, and Noah's all happy on it. But then what's going on is that now you're seeing memes and things that are addressed, like, wait a minute, you'll have that picture and then they'll have, you know, graphically shown, you know, hundreds of dead bodies floating on the water saying, you know, you're looking at that part of the story, but you're forgetting this part. Or Joshua uh, in Jericho, you know, you'll know that story and have the happy photos, and I just was looking at it, the wall, uh, mural of all of these happy soldiers blowing the trumpets. You can see the, you know, the remnant, the beginning of the walls tumbling, but then it doesn't say, they don't say, but then what happened when they actually went inside or attacked? Then it says that they uh, killed women uh, and elderly and young, you know? So I think what's going on is the stories that you did here in the Old Testament, what's now going on is then the bloody parts, you know, or the, the graphical sense of that God was commanding or at times, you know, uh, armies to kill people, the flood was killing people. So I think that's now being brought to the surface there was a young university student that said he had known about the Exodus story and always was celebrating it. Then he was on an intervarsity group on campus reading through Exodus. And all of a sudden he started thinking that, wait a minute, um, the uh, God killed the firstborn of, of the Egyptians. Um, we know that Herod would killed the you know, two-year-old and under in Bethlehem. And we say that was evil, horrible for him to do. But now he's suddenly, as a young adult, when he's studying Exodus, saying, why is it okay for God to kill the firstborn? And yeah. that's the tension that's coming up now. Yeah. Is they kind of knew some of the nice stories, but now the not-so-nice sounding stories without explanation are being uh, pointed out. Yeah, and I think, you know, my response is to, is to commend to people and say, okay, it's good that you're noticing this stuff and you're pointing it out, and the tension you're spotting is real. Um, I, I don't think pe people should be um, looked down or um, cast aside or derided. It's like, oh, well, you just don't believe the Bible then or something like that. I, I think, you know, that type of thing um, help. But it does pose a question and the question needs to be answered. And you can answer it in a number of different ways. You can simply say, well, the God of the Old Testament is a kind of mean, angry God. And Jesus has uh, delivered us from him. And now we know better. 
instead of a rageaholic God, we've got a, a nice kind God, kind of like, you know, Anglican version of Morgan Freeman, you know, something, something better like that, something better than like that. Uh, right. But yeah, you, yeah, you do have, you do have to wrestle with, you know, with, with that, with that kind of stuff and know, knowing the difference between, you know, you know, divine judgment, divine mercy, you know, those sorts of things. I mean, well, I mean, you brought the thing up. What, what do you say about that particular tension or that particular, you know, um, question that someone's brought up? Yeah, I mean, I mean, here's the good, the good news in it is that, you know, this isn't new things in the Bible that we're suddenly just discovering for the first time. And there's so many, you know, scholarly thoughts of, of all of this and great research out there. But what hasn't been done, in my opinion, is that it hasn't been taught in many churches, uh, you know, even going down to youth ministry and younger, so that when they do hear about it, or as they grow into young adulthood and start saying, like, wait a minute, uh, God killed the firstborn, like, and, and thinking about it more deeply, that it's not such a shock to them as it would be, and then catching them off guard. You know, yeah. so, I mean, there's some great scholars, Paul Capan, you mentioned William, uh, William Webb, right? Yeah, yeah. Who wrote that the new book about Old Testament violence. You know, there's some great research and scholarly writings on all of this. I do think church leaders need to pay attention to this and start teaching some of this earlier on so that when they do hear about it, it's not going to catch them off guard. Um, yep. God did use violence, you know, so, you know, you, you know, you know, Mary Poppins, right? Yep. Well, not personally, but I, I know the story. But I mean, I use this illustration. You can go on on uh, YouTube, and there's a 60 second movie um, called Scary Mary, and uh, someone took little clips of Mary Poppins, you know. And Mary Mary Poppins, if you know the story, uh, she's a, you know a good magical nanny who comes in to help the family, so it's all good, and she helps the family in the end. But someone took little clips from that from the movie, and then it was when she was staring at outside, and all of the nannies that were applying for the job that clipped in that of all of them being blown away, or she's looking in the room and the kid gets sucked up the chimney or, and stuff like that. And then they piece it together, and then it ends with "Scary Mary, hide your children." And now we, if you've seen the movie, you're like, oh, they pieced together it. That's not Mary Poppins. But if you never if you never knew the story of Mary Poppins, you really would think it was a horror story. And I think that's what's going on with the Bible, is that people are pulling stuff out. You don't know God's character of what he said about himself, loving, kind, compassionate, forgiving, slow to anger, like all of this begging people to please repent. And uh, and all they're seeing is, you know, you pull out those stories and then it's painting a picture of God in a way that he really isn't. So they're, you know, they're painting scary God instead of the loving, kind, compassionate God that sometimes used acts of violence, but that, but his character is about love, compassion, and forgiveness, you know, begging yeah. people. To repent. Yeah, that, that, that's, you, a, that's a very good way of putting it. Yeah, but you don't know that if you don't know the whole story. So all of a sudden you're seeing these little bits of it and you think God's scary Mary, right? So that's, that's actually, why I, I mean, that's why I have hope in all of this. God's God, and he's a loving, wonderful, compassionate God, and the gospel, and Jesus, and everything's so wonderful, but we just have to make sure people know it so that when they hear alternatives, it's not going to catch them off guard, or, or in that type of a thing. I think that's a good way of putting it. Um, yeah, but I, I also agree that you know, this is, this is the, I think it's one of the biggest questions. My my colleague, Scott Harrow, out here at Ridley, I mean, he teaches like ethics. He also teaches apologetics. And he says, like, you know, five, five years ago, the, the, big, the big question everyone had was about, you know, LGBT issues. How do Christians respond to that, that debate, that conversation? What are the, you know, what do we believe you know, historically? What are our best pastoral responses? But now he says you know, the big question is you know, dealing with those difficult parts of the Bible. You know, the, you know, those, those you know, some people call them the texts of terror you know, like right. the things you point out. And yeah, like it's the danger is you just take, you just pick these little things, make a meme out of them. And, you know, and that, and that can become enough to kind of put you off the Bible or put you off Christianity, but it's, it's not telling the whole story. It's not the proper story. Um, it's not, the, it's not a story of intertribal violence. It's, it's, it's the story of God rescuing creation um, in and through um human malevolence and, and misery and the muck and mire of human existence and, and and that type of thing that type of thing 
That's good. No. Well, what's yeah. I was going to say, and that's the, that's what's going on. Slavery, it's the same thing. Pulling out the verses about slavery, hiding yeah. those, comparing them. I mean, I, to yeah, I find that one frustrating. I find that one frust the slavery one. Because, you know, in my view, I mean, slavery was just part of the world, okay, whether it was the, you know, um, the Canaanites, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Rome, all the, all the way up until like the Ottomans, all the way up until like the Ottomans in the late Middle Ages, slavery was largely part of the ancient world. And the Bible simply understands this as part of the way the world is. And, you know, doing a mass emancipation of slaves was not possible uh, or necessarily even immediately desirable, because if you free all the slaves, then they're suddenly just going to be uh, unemployed and starving. And that thing, and but and yet, what I find frustrating uh, is that the the Old Testament, the main the main message of the Old Testament is I I am the God who brought you out of um, Egypt, the land of slavery. I mean, that's that's the main the main you know theme of the Old Testament, you know. And then you get to the New Testament, Jesus dies a slave's death. Okay, crucifixion was for slaves and enemies of the estate. Now, the apostle Paul, yeah, yeah, he can say slaves obey your masters, but that's like you know, don't don't kick a guy in the shins if he's holding a lash. That's you know, pretty much kind of like you know, a survival mechanism. But he also tells Philemon to manumit Onesimus to his own care. He forbids um, Christians from being slave traders, that kind of a thing. And then you get into the early church. And then you do get people saying, you know, maybe we need to, you know, get rid of the slavery thing. Um, like, you know, Basil, Basil the Great is one doing, it. and you get to get the way all the way through to William Wilberforce. And I also point out the reason the Romans hated Christians is not because they said Jesus is Lord of my heart, but because they were regarded as a as a servile sect. You know, I think it was Celsus, one of the critics of Christianity, said Christianity is a religion of women, slaves, and children. In other words, the Romans despised Christianity because it was a pro-woman, pro-slave, pro-child religion. It, 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 was, it was the religion of the servile classes. And yet they were saying in Christ, there is neither slave nor free male nor free male, but all one in Christ Jesus. So, I mean, I've all, I always find the slavery thing to so um, frustrating. And I know it was, a, you know, in American history, it's been a big deal, particularly in the North versus South, the, the Civil War and there were people, but it was the evangelicals in the North who by and large were, who were the abolitionists. It was the, you know, cause I mean, up, up until about the 1980s, evangelical was considered more of a, a Yankee thing. You know, it was considered a normal phenomenon up until about the 1970s or eighties. Um, Southern Baptists did not historically consider themselves evangelicals uh, until much later. But so anyway, I'm getting animated. That's, that's one of my little, um, um, pet peeves, if you like, and oh yeah, and another thing: if the Bible's pro-slavery, Martin Luther King did not get the memo because the brother was was quoting the Bible left, right, and center. And um, you could argue that the the civil rights movement was overtly theological because it was largely resourcing the language literature, um, the texts and language of the Old Testament, um, uh, in, in the case for for free for freedom and for you know for voting for voting rights and that type of thing. But anyway, sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting a little bit too animated here. I'm getting too animated. But I wish, uh, well, one, I could I could listen to you talk about this stuff like for hours and hours and hours. And I, I'll just say this side note. I'm so grateful as a church leader to people like yourself and other scholars who, who know this, research it, and then um, write it in a way, because you're so readable, too, in, in how you write, so that we can learn from you. So I thank you for what you do and, and all the research that you have and know and can share with us. But what you just said, say about slavery, right? I listened to that, I'm like, man, that sounds so right. And that, that's so good to know. What you hear out here is like, look, the Bible is for the African-American kidnapped slavery. You see these Bible verses and look at the graphics and then people aren't thinking beyond that and then making judgments about the Bible and about the Christian faith based on that surface level sort of exploration. And that's really sad. And, and, uh, and what's scary to me is that when Christians themselves don't think too deeply and then make judgments about their own faith and have these things compiled to then say, I, I can't believe anymore when it's, uh, and there's probably more going on in their lives, but boy, um, you can't use these arguments about slavery or women. I mean, same thing with women. Yeah. It's a huge one about how the Bible's anti-women and 
all, all of these things. And, you know, and again, Bible verses, the memes, they sure look like, boy, the, the Christian Bible hates women. The church must really demean women. And that's not the case at all when you study it beyond the, beyond the memes. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. Well, I thank you for your work as well, Dan. Uh, it's good to have thoughtful pastors who, who I, I like to think are trying to think two steps ahead of the game, and you know, thinking about okay, ra- rather than rather than you know, an ambulance dealing with this issue, it'd be great if we could inoculate people against you know so, some of this stuff, and having a better, richer, deeper knowledge of the Bible, including its difficult bits. You know, there's texts of terror, there's stuff that do make you raise an eyebrow and go, hmm, be able to um, thoughtfully uh, engage that with, you know, with in, you know, in the Bible in, in all of its glory and all of its warts, we might say, uh, I think right. is a good thing. But uh, as we as we come to a close, Dan, um, what's the number one thing you hope people get out of your book? What's the number one takeaway um, you would like read, re- readers to get out of this book? Yeah, I mean, underneath, it's sort of a, uh, a hermeneutics books, book in disguise that kind of uses slavery, anti-women, violent, all of those kind of passages, because I'm hoping that Christians will learn to really understand the Bible storyline and some basic Bible study methods, so that when these verses and other ones come up, they won't get caught off guard. And I, and I do hope parents read this, mm. grandparents, because... They, I've heard multiple times, kids ask their parents, and the parents are like, "That's in the Bible," or "I don't know," and they yeah. can confuse the kid and like have their confidence in the Bible and their faith start, you know, wondering because there's so much reinforcement now out there against the Bible, and that's what I do hope this book, uh, you know, that this book brings. And church leaders, I mean, I'm what starts rolling me up is the church, at least in the States, we've paid so much attention to making sure we're multiplying by video venues and, and applic- you know, we've taught people to just look at the Bible and immediately jump to, not who is it written to, why, where in the Bible storyline. It's like, oh, what is it saying to me in my life now? We've taught people by just focusing so much, it's needed, but on felt need teaching, we've taught people to even view the Bible incorrectly. And I think so... And, you know, we can have great video venues and videos and, and great worship music and all the things that we need. But, man, we got to really pay t- attention to theology again for the churches that aren't doing that. Yeah, so that's my that's my mission right now. So. That's cool. That sounds like a great mission. That sounds like a great mission. Uh, my mission, I guess, writing my book is hopefully people become competent enough in the Bible that they don't need that extra level of pastoral care, that they're, they're, they're not going to be surprised by the Bible. They're not going to be put off by anything. They're going to wrestle with it uh, in all of its complexity, all its beauty, all of its, its grandeur. And so when they do come across one of those difficult things, they're not going to be unequipped to be able to do with it. They're not going to get, they're not going to get uh, flummoxed or really scandalized by some meme or by some, you know, youtube video or by some tiktok video that's just right. come out or, or something like that so yeah i like to think we've got a lot of synergy doing what we're here uh well anyway dan always always good to talk to you uh god bless you in your ministry and uh again just reminding you it's dan's book uh, how not to read the bible um i cannot say without doubt uh this is something you should give to every teenage christian you know at least and there's probably a lot of a lot of pastors and maybe older people too so um, I'm, 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 I am literally going from my little hovel here to my, um, one of my daughter's rooms, and I'm going to tell her to read that. And I may have to bribe her with something um, in order to get her off her, um, um, her Instagram account. But uh, I definitely I'm going to get her to read uh, this for one. It is a tremendous book. So, well, yes. I have yours on PDF. Uh, when it comes out, I'd be holding hers up, too. I know you would. I know you would, Dan. I know you would. Uh, but uh, that's good. Um, I'll include some of the um, links to the book uh, in in the in the uh, video below. I'll, I'll give all the information who they, those who want to know for the book, and they, they can look that up. Sonovan's made seven little animated videos to set up each section, and we're just about ready to put up uh, like kind of you know free downloadable study guides so it can oh. be taught six six weeks and all of that stuff to really help any church or youth group that wants to kind of use it for small groups or teaching through it in six weeks. So 
that's all going up. And so thankful is honored to put those together. Yeah, I think it'd be a great thing for um, church groups, um, so, you know, senior youth groups or you know, university groups definitely to go through. Uh, because if, if you're not wrestling with this stuff, one day it's going to get shoved in your face. And, um, uh, it's, and, and uh, to make sure you come through, you need to be equipped. You know, you, um, you, don't play, you don't play NFL naked. I know that much. You don't play or, or ice hockey. You don't play ice hockey. It's a better. You don't play ice hockey naked. Uh, you need to have the right equipment, the right equipment in your mind, the right strength and faith, that kind of a thing. I have no idea. That's I know that's a ten pin ball. I have no idea what that is, Dan. No, this is the sport of America. So for this ten pin bowling. Yeah. I okay. Bowling. Okay. I'll, I'll, I mean, I've done wee bowling. I've done wee bowling. That's about as far as I. Yeah, I do like bowling. I'm not. Uh, I don't know much about football, but I like bowling. Okay, fair enough. Well, I like I didn't mention rugby. You probably know even less. Well, anyway, Dan, all the best. Um, over in California and uh, no doubt I'll hopefully I'll catch you up again in the near future. And it's been great right. talking to you. Yep. It's great talking to you. Thank you for all you do. Thanks. Thank you so much.